Welcome, everybody. This is Peter Diamandis, and this is our next edition of Exponential Wisdom. I'm here with my dear friend, my coach, Dan Sullivan. And Dan, I'm feeling how fast the world is changing. I'm feeling the increasing pace of change. You know, technology is just not accelerating, that the speed of the acceleration is itself accelerating. And I've been reflecting on this, especially during this pandemic, and I'd love to share some thoughts with you and get your input because it's insane how fast the world of technology is moving. Are you feeling the same thing I am? Well, I don't see it as close up as you do. I will say this, that I think there has been a noticeable change of mindset during the COVID year. It's that we always made a distinction in coach between lifestyle entrepreneurs and growth entrepreneurs. So lifestyle entrepreneurs are people who at one time looked like they were growing, but they got to where they want to be. They've got the lifestyle they want. You know, they've got their company on autopilot. You know, their biggest goal is a higher level golf membership. <laughs> then there's the ones who they're always making their future bigger than their past. Okay, so that they're experimenting with new things. They're getting more skilled who's in their network. They're doing collaborations outside their company. They're creating new value creation inside their company. And what I noticed that the moment that the lockdown was announced pretty well through all of our jurisdictions where you know people can travel and they couldn't travel, that those two groups who were intermingled with each other split. The lifestyle entrepreneurs didn't come back to us when we offered the Zoom program, but the growth entrepreneurs loved Zoom. Not only did they love doing coach with Zoom or some other virtual platform, because there are other virtual platforms, but they immediately started saying, we love how you're doing this. We want to do this with our own companies. We've mostly been local. Now we want to be regional. We are regional. Now we want to be national. National, we want to be global. They did this very, very quickly. And I was just reflecting on why it was so different over the last year. The fast people just started going fast. They weren't complaining about the slow people or the no-go people. They just bypassed them and just went fast. You know, maybe there isn't arguing about it in some sectors, and you can just go as fast as you want, and maybe that's what you're picking up on. Yeah, I am picking up on that, but I'm also picking up on, there's an old saying that I have, which is no bucks, no buck Rogers, right? If you measure the rate at which capital is flowing into startups around the world, you get a sense of the growth you're going to be seeing. It's like how much fertilizer are you putting into the soil here? And it shocked me, literally, that 2020 beat out 2019, which beat out 2018. 2020 was the high of venture capital investing around the world. There was more capital invested in startups in 2020. And then it was also, according to The Economist, the global high of capital deployed in industries, not startups, industries around the world. And I was just amazed, right? Because you would have imagined that during a pandemic, things would have been pulled back. But in fact, I think people said, oh, like I say, the world's biggest problems, the world's biggest business opportunities, all of these problems of how do we reinvent healthcare? How do we reinvent retail? How do we reinvent education? And capital just poured in. And yeah. that capital is like planting the seeds that are going to start to sprout and pop up towards the end of 21 and 22, 23, I think we'll see a brand new crop of new Google, SpaceX, Uber, Airbnb-like companies that are coming out of no place. Yeah, I think about this, you know, when we're driving to the office and driving home, a stretch of our trip is on an expressway. I often reflect because I'm never doing the driving, someone else is doing the driving, and I'm just watching in good times, it's like 40 or 50 miles an hour. And I said, what if you took somebody from a century ago and just popped him in the passenger seat here and he had to experience this the first time? I think the person would go catatonic in about 15 <laughs> seconds. You know, you go, oh, 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 like this. And yet we're going along and, you know, some people are illegally on their phones and everything. <laughs> and everybody's just moving in and out and, you know, and then... 
on the super stretches when you can do 70 miles an hour, nobody's thinking anything of it. So take that model, which is perception of speed in a physical sense, and let's take it 10 years ago when we first met of what people thought was fast then and what's fast right now. The people who are good at this, how do they think differently yeah. that things can be so fast and yet in some sense it's kind of normal or it's kind of expected? Yeah, it really is a level of agility. I want to digress for a second because I remember a few years back, I took an overnight flight from LA to New York to have a meeting and then got there, had the meeting and then flew back that day. And as I was flying back, I was looking out the window, crossing the Great Plains, and I was just thinking to myself what I had just done, right, compared to 100 or 150 years ago when the stagecoach was there, literally having crossed the country twice in 24 hours where it would have taken you, you know, months and months if you were lucky to survive it. You know, it really is a mindset of agility. It's being able to let go of the past instantly and say, okay, this is now possible. These are my new tools and accept it and start to reorient how you combine things and move forward. You know, we don't realize how fast the world is changing. As you know, every year when I open up Abundance 360, the three-day program that I used to kick off the year with many coach members, yourself and such, I look back 100 years and then I look back a year. And so this year, I look back to the year 1921 to see what were the breakthroughs of the year 1921. And myself and my team, we scan all of the literature, the patent office, looking for any breakthroughs, any inventions, innovations, whatever it might be. And I'm always blown away by how few there are. This year, there were six. Let's see if I can remember them. There was the discovery and the first use of insulin. That happened in Toronto, by the way. Okay. All right. Yeah, batting and best. There's a famous lab at the University of Toronto that happened at the University of Toronto. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Kudos to Toronto. We invented the lie detector. The car was new. And so the headrest was invented. The automobile headrest that you keep your head from snapping back as accidents started to occur. The overhead manual garage door, the use of airplanes for crop dusting. And I was like, that was it. Mm -hmm. And there was one other thing that was interesting was the use of the word robot for the first time ever in a play. And the you know, the, the one that was a uh, Czech, he was from yeah, Czech, was a, Czech, a Czech playwright. Yeah. And the yeah. theme of the play, which I found interesting was man invents robot and then robot kills man. <laughs> you know, Hollywood's always been dystopian on this stuff. But yeah. those were the inventions of the year. And we get those many inventions of that level per microsecond today, I think. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing, and again, that's a topic that we talk about constantly, is that we're, by historic standards, we're living in the safest world that's ever existed. It's the most abundant world that's ever existed. It's the most, what I would say, responsive to individual ambition of any heavy world or thing. And yet, it seems that the safer and better and easier things get, the more the part of the brain that's reptile gets stimulated by some part of our economy, which is the media economy, the movie movie economy. So as a species, do we do that intentionally? In other words, the better things are, we have this fear, we better watching out, the sucker punch is coming, you know, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, we have a lot to lose water. now. We have a lot to lose. We better not lose it. We're protecting ourselves. You know, it's like one of the reasons I ask, why do all these billionaires hoard their capital instead of doing something with it? You know, they want to go from being on number you know, 50 on the Forbes list to number 40. And it's like, no, no, no. Do something with your capital, like make a difference, make a dent on the planet, you know, set aside a billion dollars, that's fine. And go spend the other 20 or 30 to go make a difference on the planet. But yet we don't. Peter, last time you talked about kind of new vehicles for capital investment. And my feeling is that the SPAC, which we spoke about last time, yeah. it was almost demanded because there was so much capital that wanted to find new investments that the conventional vehicles for actually doing this were too slow. They were too clogged up. 
they wouldn't deliver where the capital was needed for the technological breakthrough. Yeah, and SPACs, you know, special purpose acquisition companies are delivering capital to companies earlier and faster, accelerating their growth. So there's this virtuous and accelerating cycle that looks like this. There's more capital than ever before, number one. Number two, the individual entrepreneur is got access to more technology than ever before, more tools to do stuff. Number three, the cost of doing those things with those tools are now cheaper than ever before. So they can run more experiments than ever before to find better product market fits, right? Like the first genome was like $3 billion to sequence and it was $100 million to sequence. And then it got down to a million dollars to sequence. Now it's below $1,000 to sequence. So all of a sudden, if you had a million dollars 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you could sequence 10 years ago, a single genome. Today, you can sequence 1,000 genomes or 10,000 genomes with that to run your experiment. So we're demonetizing and democratizing the tools of innovation, which means more crazy ideas being tried, which means more breakthroughs, right? Going back to that saying, I love to say that the day before something is really a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. And more crazy ideas mean more moonshots, which means more billion dollar unicorns, which means more capital flowing in. And it's not slowing down. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I've worked on, as you know, for the last two years is the human component to exponential technology. And, you know, we came out with a book. It's a bestseller. You know, we're eight times bestseller. Who not how, my favorite. Who not how. And what I notice is that if you are using exponential technology and your teamwork is based on who not how, you actually don't have the sense that things are speeding up. You actually have the sense that things are slowing down. Because you're handing off things to do to the who's and giving yourself more freedom. Yeah, you're doing what you love doing, which you do, you know, I mean, if you're totally immersed in what you love doing, you don't actually have a sense of passage of time. Yeah. What your writer buddy talks about, the flow state. Yes, you know, the flow state. Steve Kotler. Yeah. Well, you just don't have a feeling that time's going by otherwise. It's doing things that we don't like doing with no endpoint that makes, you know, that really screws up our time. But yeah, I mean, it's almost like there's two worlds. It's like they're separated. You know, there's the world of griping and there's the world of new jumps, the world of new breakthroughs. And I often wonder if... There isn't a separation going on, a very significant separation going on socially, culturally. But Dan, you know, I'm sitting here spending time with you talking about subjects we both enjoy, and I'm realizing how much fun it is and how I have no idea how much time has passed by, right? So the who, not how element is also like that puts you into flow is like if you're spending time with people you love spending time with and doing stuff that you love doing, then life is a joy. It is so true. And that's, of course, a lot of the complementary elements that Coach has for the exponential tech that we do at A360. Mm -hmm. I think in this accelerating world, your mindset as an entrepreneur is fundamental. Yeah. Right. One of the interesting mindsets that I think is important a lot of people get frustrated, like, oh, my God, I missed that opportunity. I missed that opportunity. I missed that opportunity. If I'd only come up with Uber or Airbnb, if I invested in Bitcoin when it was a thousand bucks, and now it's, you know, 60,000 bucks, whatever the case might be. But if you've got an abundance mindset, you realize that every year there are bigger and more opportunities. So forget about what you missed. Just get excited well, about the next. Take your you know, your investment in the vaccine company. Yeah. They won't be in the big spotlight this year, but in coming years, because they can do so much else. You know, in the world of abundance, by definition, if you have an abundance attitude, you're not being left out and you're not being left behind. Those are scarcity mindsets. People say, well, you know, this is taking longer than I thought. And I said, well, just extend your lifetime another 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was thinking of, you know, from your doctor at Harvard, you know, with backing life David up. Sinclair or George Church? David Sinclair. I said, yeah, there's two ways of doing it. You can take yourself backwards age-wise, but you can also extend your 
lifespan, you know, I've had my 156 goal for 30, 35 years. I started in 87, so it's 35 years. And people say, do you actually think you're going to live to 156? And I said, I know if I don't have it as a goal, I won't live to 156. And I said, but because I have that goal, I'm really alert. I'm really curious. I'm, you know, I'm really responsive to any news that indicates that I'm on the right track. And my job is to deliver you lots of news on that. <laughs> yes. Dr. Diamandis, should you accept this assignment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm very excited, and I hope we get a real fast, real quick response on the open seats for the August longevity trip, because I'd like to have some coach people there that we can chat about this in light of conversations that some of them have had with me for pretty well. I've got 32 who are crossing over 30 years this year. I'm so blown away and impressed by how their longevity and coaches, the value that you deliver to them that they want to be there for decades with you. That's just extraordinary. Yeah. 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 And I just want to pass on something which yeah. we're very grateful for. We've had 61 signups for a coach directly from A360 over the years. We have a lifetime value. And I have to tell you, that's a great achievement that we've had, you know, and it's six, seven a year, which is great. It comes in from you know, conversations that you have. It's the experience of A360 itself. It's the it's a great digital webinars all the way through. It's great. I'm just so pleased. And just to think what Babs and I are going to be able to experience this August yeah. because of a conversation at Genius Network 10 years ago. Yeah, that's really our remarkable. dear friend, Joe Polish, the great connector. I think Joe's doing a great job so far. We've talked to him, but we can only talk to him about his sabbatical. We can't talk know, about it. I know. I texted with him earlier. Joe is on a year-long sabbatical, which is interesting, right? Because my first reaction as an entrepreneur, when someone says, take a year off, I'm like, I get nervous. I get fidgety. It's like, oh my God, you know, what am I going to miss? How can everything? But of course, if you have an abundance mindset, pause for a year it's all going to be there and much more a year from now. And if you have followed Dan's, your teachings, you get a self-managing company, that's going to be fine a year from now. I just had this conversation with a friend and business partner this morning. If we really are adding decades onto our lives, it really should translate to enjoying your life more now. Mm-hmm right? Taking the time to not be in a rush because my biggest challenge has been the genetic sequence of more is better. And that's not necessarily always true. Well, the interesting thing I tell people, you know, I'm of the belief that every individual operates on a different time system. And the reason is that it isn't like space. We get more training on how to operate in space than we do operating in time. I don't know people who have nervous breakdowns because they can't get to the horizon. <laughs> I know people who have nervous breakdowns because they don't get to their ideal. You know, so the ideal is the way we measure time. You know, we, we have something in the future that very excites us. So I talk to people. I say, tell me what the best possible thing that could happen in your future what would it be? And they name some achievement or some event. And I say, okay, so I want you to imagine that you've achieved that. How do you feel? And I said, oh, it's spectacular. I just feel amazing. And I said, now, that event is tomorrow. How do you feel? I don't know. It's another day. <laughs> and I said, you know, the future, when you actually get to it, is normal. <laughs> yeah. It was interesting. I have burned into my memory the day that the $10 million Ansari X Prize got won, right? I'm on the tarmac. Burt Rutan had flown Spaceship One to altitude five days earlier, and he had just taken off, and he's flying up. I'm there with my dad and thousands, tens of thousands of people in the, in the Mojave Desert watching this thing. We've got live television from around the world. Of course, this is October 4th of 2004, and I had been working on this for a decade. And the moment comes, he's made the trip, they land, and I remember like taking a pause, to, how do I feel? And 
I felt like, oh, okay, well, that's done. What's next? And I remember <laughs> I felt like I was at the top of a mountain peak. And as I looked around, all I saw were more mountain peaks. So that was one of the most interesting reflective moments I've had, for sure. Yeah, I don't know which astronaut it was, but there's been 12 who walked on the moon. Yes. He came back at a time that they weren't giving him ticker tape parades down Madison Avenue, and they weren't inviting you to the White House anymore. <laughs> I've been there, done that. He got back to Houston, and you know he had a weekend with his family and his friends. And then on the Monday, he said he was going down to NASA headquarters. And his wife said, now that you're around for a while, can you pick up some ground beef on the way home? <laughs> I love that story. That is awesome. Yeah. It's like, on January 7th of this year, Elon surpassed Jeff Bezos as being the wealthiest person on the planet. And he was on Twitter. That was the day he and I started a conversation that ended up in the $100 million X Prize that he's funded that we're announcing on Earth Day. But I remember someone said to him, what's it feel like to be the wealthiest person on the planet? He goes, oh, interesting. Time to get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Warren Buffett on the night. This is a really interesting thing. So the Dow went from 2,700 to 1,800. This was in October of 1987. I was in New York City, and New York City is a very, very strange day when you have a stock market plunge. So anyway, I was watching probably CNN, and they had Warren Buffett on. Mr. Buffett, what do you think is going to happen now? That was a 40% drop in the market. And he said... Well, it's 1987. He said, I think that probably by the year 2000, the Dow will be at 10,000. You know, everybody says, what? It's at 1800. He says, yeah, but you got to think about it. He says, think of all the scientists that are alive today, all the engineers who are alive today, all the inventors, all the investors, and they're all connected electronically. How can there not just be a overwhelming amount of new things that people want to invest in, you know. It just really, really struck me how pessimistic that a lot of people are, you know, yeah, yeah, we've done great things in the past, but I don't think it's going to happen again, you know. And I said, you know, I believe all that stuff. I watched your longevity film, and I said, if it's your purpose to take advantage of this breakthrough, you'll find a way to take advantage of it. Yeah. And I think all of us can remember sort of last March when the markets were plummeting during the pandemic and the question was, oh my God, how long is this going to last and how bad a year is it going to be? And, you know, for some people health-wise, it was awful. And for some people who lost their jobs, you know, my heart goes out to them. But again, to set all new time record highs in the Dow and the NASDAQ and in investments and insane just insane. It's just, we are living in this extraordinary engine. And then, of course, watching cryptocurrencies have been fascinating, watching Bitcoin just explode onto the scene, you know, trillion dollars plus in that. And that's a whole other conversation about fiat currency and what's going to be happening in that regard. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, you have some basic thoughts that allow you to come to grips. There's an economist who I've read a lot of his stuff by the name of Hayek, and he won the Nobel Prize in the early 1950s. He won it for another book, but he wrote a book which is called The Fatal Conceit, Why Central Planning of Economies Doesn't Work. It's impossible for a few individuals to have all the information that you need to make decisions for everybody else. He said that the big problem is that capitalism got a bad name because it was its enemies that actually named it. There wasn't a thing called capitalism prior to 1800. Nobody used the word. It was Marx and some of those thinkers around 1840, 1850. Actually, he said capitalism isn't about capital. Capital is a reward for capitalism. If you're playing the game of capitalism right, one of the rewards you get is more capital. But he said, actually, what capitalism actually is, is an ever-expanding system of increasing trust among strangers. Okay. Yep. I'm in. Yeah. And those that can establish ever-expanding systems of trust among strangers are where all the capital in the world wants to flow. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, I think many of us can remember the first time we put our credit card online 
And it's like, is this thing going to be safe? You know, is this Amazon thing going to deliver me the thing I just bought from them? And of course, there is an extraordinary level of trust now with Apple, with Google. You know, is the information Google is serving me really real and true? And so those systems that we that have tremendous trust in that have gone global are the ones where we've achieved trillion dollar valuations. Absolutely. Yeah, and the big thing is if something proves itself not trustworthy, the solution isn't to stop using it. The solution is improve it so that it's trustworthy. Or it will stop to exist. Yeah, it stopped. You know, I was speaking, uh, it was in the early 90s, and I was a guest speaker one night somewhere, and the person sitting next to me was a man by the name of D. Bach. And D. Bach is the person who single-handedly went across America and got the individual banks to buy into the Visa program. Huh. Visa, And he said it was the hardest conversation to get a banker saying, why by being a part of this much bigger system with people I don't know, should I feel better? And he says, because of that, you're dealing with all these other people who you can work with. He says, that's why it works. You know, it's Metcalf's law. The, the number of connected users we have exponentially increases the possibilities of cooperation and creativity and capital. So, And what people, I think, to go back to the original start of this conversation, I think most folks don't have front of mind, I don't have front of mind, is that in the next four or five years, we're going to start to have AI agents that we trust that will establish trusted relationships with other AI agents. And the Internet of Things, which is like 35 billion connected devices now, will grow to 100 billion and a trillion connected devices. And all of this is just accelerating the speed of interactions, of trade, which is accelerating the flow of capitalism and capital and accelerating the breakthroughs and the moonshots being taken. Yeah. It's a virtuous accelerating cycle. Yeah, I had my company and my team brainstorm once how many automatic buddies they had, little slaves that they had working for them from morning till night when they get up in the morning to I've got a Sony clock radio that we've had for 40 years. Hey, let me see your watch. What watch do you have on? This is from Polar. This actually keeps track of my heart rate, you know. Oh, okay. But it's really good. There's three numbers, 252 two right now. Two is the hour and the 52 is the uh, minute. It's a wonderful watch. <laughs> anyway, and I said, no, just talk about it. And they said, well, for example, I said, well, the thermostat in your house, is that a little slave that does yeah but that's old techno i said yeah but it's good technology yep. and they went through and everybody came up with about 25 or 30 little automatic i think you're the one who gave me that that the average person not a millionaire but someone who's you know average income average type of lifestyle and everything else you have about two thousand slaves who do your work without you realizing it every day, that are built into all the systems that support you. And then you have your individual technologies. And I said, you don't think things are good because you don't have enough appreciation for what's been created for you and what's provided to you. And you didn't have anything to do with it. It just was other people improving things and you got the benefit of it. Yeah, these are the things that create the abundance of time that allow us to do everything else you know, we have all these robots in our life, but we end up calling it a dishwasher or a vacuum cleaner whenever it becomes really part of common day life. We don't call it a robot anymore. We give it a common name and then it's a thing. It's like you take for granted. Anyway, this was a fun conversation, Dan. Yeah, you're excited to lead it and we're excited to be on it. But I think the longevity trip is this is a very, very important five days that Babs and I are going to have in August. Yeah, it's great for those who don't know what that is. And we can talk about it on, on a future session. Every year I run a five-day longevity platinum trip. We visit the top scientists, labs, entrepreneurs, companies, leading the field across every tech that is extending the healthy human lifespan. It was so popular. We were doing it twice this year, once in August and once in September. Last year we did it in San Diego and San Francisco. This year we're doing it in Boston, Cambridge, New York, New Jersey. You know, the field has gone from something that people were crazy to talk about to the hottest field of age reversal, not just 
slowing down aging or stopping aging, age reversal. So what is that? You know, maybe next time we can talk about what are the implications if we truly have age reversal? What's going to happen in our lives if you can sort of like be 40 or 45 or 50 or 30, whatever you want for decades? I mean, the implications societally, financially, religiously, all of these things. Yeah. Well, do you buy in a general description or a general statistic on how your life is going to be? Or you just decide that your life is going to be what you want it to be? Yeah. Fun conversations yeah. always, my friend. I remember I went to a 25th high school reunion, so I was 43. I went and my team wanted to know about it, so I came back and they said, so how was it? And I said, nobody showed up. I said, they sent a bunch of old people in their place. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's amazing how important mindset is, but we'll talk about that. All right, pal, let me just mention for anybody interested in Abundance 360, I coach 360 entrepreneurs and leaders every year. We spend four days together in January, virtually and in physical presence, and then we meet five or six times during the year virtually. And we cover all of these topics, exponential technologies, what's happened in the last year, what's happening in the next two or three years, how you can use it, an abundance mindset, deep dive into longevity. How do you add 10, 20, 30 healthy years on your life? If that's you and you'd like to uh, apply to join, it's not for everybody. One out of 10 people come in. It's www.a360.com, abundance360.com. Dan? Yes, and we have a complete growth plan for entrepreneurs to uh, achieve their own self-managing companies and self-multiplying companies with the entrepreneur just focused on what they do best and what they love and then have a complete personal life that makes all your success worthwhile. That's at strategicoach.com and one of our membership advisors will chat with you about it. Buddy, have a wonderful day. See you next time. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Dan. 